Texas Business Women usually sponsor this when we have uh, any kind of election. We normally hold it at the courthouse, but we do have quite a few people. We invited the Democrats and the Republicans to join us this evening. Uh, some were not able to be here tonight, but I did want to thank uh, Martin Nash. This is his precinct. And he takes care of this nutrition center, and he offered for us to use it because we thought we'd have probably a little bigger crowd. I do want to introduce the uh, TBW members. They are the timekeepers. Eileen, good for being here. Sharon, <laughs> Amy, Sharon, and Amy. I think that and Marianne. That the each candidate speak for two minutes on any topic, and afterwards, if you have any questions, you can do your thing. We're going to try to get everybody to, to ask a question, and you can address it to any candidate that you would like. Um, and if there is another candidate that would like to make a comment about it, you'll have 30 seconds to do that also. All right. Um, I'd like for us to start with maybe a Pledge of Allegiance, so let's all rise. A Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Also, I'd like to have just a quick prayer. Sharon, could you give us a quick prayer? Dear God, thank you for the wonderful weather we had today, and also thank you for these people that are running to make our life a little bit easier. Amen. Amen. All right, I'd like to start off with the senators, then the congressmen. Mike Hamilton is uh, the only one representing the state here, and then we're going to start off with uh, our local... We'll start off with Hennigan for the county and we'll come on down this way. Alrighty. So I'd like to have Leela come up first. Let's go. She's a senator. Thank you very much, Lois. My name is Leela Pittenger and I'm running for the United States Senate. For full disclosure, in the Republican race for the U.S. Senate, there are nine candidates. Eight men and one fabulous woman. Hey. <laughs> Tell you why that's so important. Out of 100 U.S. Senators, we only have 17 women. Of those 17 women, only five are Republican, and of those five, only one is conservative. Now, I think it's very important that we get more women up there because the women of this country make 80% of the health care decisions, they do 80% of the caregiving, they make 80% of the financial decisions, and they are more and more of them in college and more of them opening small businesses than the, even the men in our country. We need more of the women who are doing these things in the U.S. Senate to be very plain with the federal government and its bureaucrats and tell them, get your mitts off my kids, get your hands out of my wallet, get your state out of my church, and get your bureaucrat out of my health care. Now, I'll tell you right now, I love all the men in my race. Each one of them will be very good for different reasons, but I am very different from them. Out of 100 U.S. Senators, we have 60 attorneys. I am not an attorney. <laughs> They make up 1% of our population, but they are 60% of the Senate. I have a background in agriculture, higher education, business, and health care. Four things the federal government has a chokehold on, and we've got to break that hole. But we need people who've actually done the work, not just read about it from a policy report, not just heard about it from some sort of supporter, but someone who's actually got the dirt under their fingernails, and I've done these things. Now, I want us to get our economy back on track, but I'm, even more for me, and that's more personal, is getting the health care system back on track. The federal government is responsible for most of the mess in health care. We've got to get them out of it. a full-time caregiver for six years for my husband's grandmother. I have a passion for doing what's going to happen in this country. My generation is going to take care of the largest senior population in the history of the country on the largest debt in the history of the country, and we're completely unprepared for it. My husband and I have already been doing that for six years. We've been taking care of his grandmother for six years now, and I've already done this, so I'm going to lead the way for my generation to say, I know the joys, I know the trials, and I know this can be done. My name is Leela Pittenger. I'd love your support. Thank you. The other, uh, let's start with the Congress and then Mike, as soon as they're done, you're going to want to be on. Make sure you have them. 
Okay, so, okay. I am one of 11 men running for Congress. <laughs> In District 36, I'm Stephen Takash from Baytown, Texas. Uh, just a little bit about me, I moved to Texas when I was 15 years old. People ask me, why'd you come to Texas? Well, my mom and dad moved and I was hungry. So, I went along to Texas, it took me a while to get here. I uh, moved to Liberty, graduated from Liberty High School in 1980, and then went on to Lamar University, where I received a BBA in accounting in 1991. But really, that's not what you want to know. You want to know why does a businessman from Baytown want to run for Congress? And I'll tell you why. I believe in the American dream. I watched my dad, his parents come over from Hungary, lived dirt poor. I watched my dad go to school, get an engineering degree, pull himself up, and he taught me that. And I've been able to run and start two successful businesses. I've been able to have a career with Edward Jones for the last 18 years, and I believe in the American dream. But I'll tell you, we have 536 people in Washington today, and they're not listening. They're not listening to you, they're not listening to me, they're not listening to the people anymore. I have two kids. I have a six-year-old and I have a 13-year-old daughter. And I'll tell you, I don't know what the future is going to be like for them. I look around and I look at the debt. Four years ago, the debt in this country was $8 trillion. Today, it's $16 trillion almost and rising. As an accountant, as a financial planner, it's not good enough. You deserve better. You deserve accountability. And that's what I would like to bring to Congress. I appreciate y'all having me out here. Thank you, and God bless you. Hello everybody, my name is Kim Morrell and I live in Seabrook, Texas. And I am married, small business owner, wife Elizabeth, and two beautiful young men, Matthew and Kate. I'm currently a Seabrook City Councilman who was Mayor Pro Tem during Hurricane Ike. And I am happy to run for this new district. Uh, we've been called everything from the 12 apostles to the dirty dozen. So we're just, just happy. Make sure you get out and vote, and if you can't vote twice, because we need everybody to, to get out there and vote. Uh, my, my platform is a very simple platform. It's job creation, job fulfillment, and education. I'll be glad to answer any questions about that later on and fill you in on anything you might need to know since we only have a couple of minutes to tell you our life story. I'm for easy EPA regulations here in this area. They're entirely too hard on the logging business around here. I'm for the Keystone Pipeline coming through, the dredging of the Natchez River, job creations, job creations, job fulfillment, and education. Hopefully that we'll, we'll have our children coming into elementary, from middle school into high school, and we'll guide them in one of two directions. Either they go to the left to go to college, or the right to go to two-year certificate schools that will give them the wherewithal to, to, to learn vocational education and skilled labor. We have a huge need right now in the energy corridor through Orange, through Port Arthur, through all that area for welders, diesel mechanics, crane operators, every job that's out there. And when people get married and get $20, $30 an hour in good benefits, they're a lot happier. And we've got a lot of those opportunities in this area. I'd love to tell you more. I'll answer any questions you might have. Like I said, afterwards, go to morellforcongress.com, tell you a little bit more about me. I'm very excited. Excited. I do share uh, an endorsement with a fellow uh, running mate of mine here tonight. We were endorsed earlier this week by the Houston Chronicle, and that was very nice. And we thank you, and thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mike Jackson. I am currently a member of the Texas Senate. I've been in the Texas Senate since 1999. I was elected to the Texas House of Representatives prior to that in 1988. So uh, I'm, I'm chose 
not seek re-election to the Texas Senate for, for a reason. And I've griped about what's going on in Washington, D.C. for a lot of years. And I figured after this redistricting with us gaining four brand new seats, if I didn't take an opportunity to kind of put my money where my mouth was, so to speak, I'd probably regret it the last the rest of my life. My wife, Vicki, is here with me in the audience tonight. She's my chief uh, consultant and critic and helper. And uh, if I listen to her in mind, I, I do a lot better in life. So, <laughs> gentlemen, you understand. Uh, we're in the construction business in LaPorte. We've got two kids that uh, have graduated high school, college, and are both uh, viably employed right now. And I knock on wood every day about that. But we've got some major problems in Washington, D.C. I look at uh, Texas as a model for all the other 49 states. We've done it right in Texas, and you, you look back, that's why all these people are moving here. That's why we have more Fortune 500 companies located here than any other state. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel. What we need to do is take a little bit of Texas know-how and move it to Washington, D.C. There are several issues that we can work on very quickly to turn our economy around. I, uh, like. Uh, Kim said it's uh, two minutes is not very much time to tell your life story, but uh, if you want someone that's in this race with experience that's been there and done that, I would be the person you have a lot of choices to elect somebody who's never been there. So I urge you to educate yourselves and thank you for having me. Tim Wintel. I'm a third generation Texan. I was born and raised in this district. I've been married for seven years to my beautiful wife, Dory. She's running around here somewhere. Uh, we have three wonderful kids. <clears throat> I currently live in Baytown still, and that's where I teach pre-calculus at the high school. And I also own a small business, irrigation business. We service all over the Houston area. Um, now that you know a little bit about me, let me tell you a little bit about my platform. I'm a staunch supporter of Second Amendment, pro-life issues, and the preservation of family marriage values. I will strive to repeal Obamacare. I'm going to make it my mission to end deficit spending. I also would like to see us reduce our dependency on foreign energy resources as well as increase our, I mean, our production here at home. You know, some people look at me and they want to know how old I am. I'm sure that's probably what I want to know, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you right up front. I'm 34. Okay, so. Mid-30s. <laughs> but some people think I'm, I'm still in my 20s, and I just, just let y'all know. I'm just curiosity. Just answer the curiosity question. This country was founded on, you know, what, what can we do to make this country a better country? And the fundamental change has gone on to what can I get from this country? I see a lot of my, in my students, what, you know, they, they tell each other how to go and get different government services when they don't even qualify by how they answer the questions right. And so one of my biggest issues is entitlements. I would love to do some entitlement reform, put some of the money, uh, <clears throat> stop giving all the money out. We have plenty of money coming in, but we're just giving it out for every everything underneath the sun. So I like to look at some entitlement reforms. Also, another thing is, you know, I preloaded the Keystone Pipeline, but that was fast. You know, I'm a big advocate for Keystone and the oil company. My name is Tim Wintel, uh, U.S. House Representative. Thank you. Well, how y'all doing? I don't need a mic. I, I talk loud enough as it is. I'm also in my mid-20s. <laughs> I can tell. Uh, I'm uh, Mike Hamilton. I'm state representative of District 19. Uh, I was first elected in 2003. Uh, we're the very first uh, Republican to win this district in, uh, since Reconstruction. And we had an uphill battle. Everybody always told us we could never win. And we've come a long way. We actually won the very first Republican to win Newton County. But two years ago, so it was, uh, it, we've come a long way in doing things. I'm a, uh, right now, I own a Catfish Kitchen in, in Beaumont. I'm a restaurateur. 
I've been in business for 25 years. I just bought Catfish Kitchen, but we used to have Tuffy's, and so a lot of y'all probably know me from Tuffy's Eatery in Moore Eastville, Texas. I have a wife of 25, four kids, five grandkids, and uh, so I know what it's like to, to work with the budget. Uh, I also know what it's like to have a business and, and run a business where you can get a paycheck sometimes. Sometimes you don't, so you know. Sometimes if you do get a paycheck, the wife and the kids take it. So we know, we know how all that is. You know, we've been working in, for Texas for 10 years now. And in the last 10 years, when Republicans took over the House of Representatives in uh, Texas for the first time, we have made Texas a very business-friendly state. We have worked hard to make the right environment for businesses to move here in Texas. We've had more Ford's 500 companies move here to Texas and are creating jobs faster than the whole United States. And we're working hard to keep that going and keep it in the same direction. We've also made it almost impossible to have an abortion in the state of Texas. And that didn't come easy. That was a lot of hard work and a lot of times that we did it. One of the great things, too, that I'm real happy that our, uh, our great president up there has done, we, you know, in my, in my uh, commercials it says we cling to our Bibles and our guns. Is that finished or? Okay, we got to cling to our Bibles and our guns, and I believe that uh, wholeheartedly. And I was a very big sponsor of something that he's trying to do right now, which is gay marriage. Uh, we were a very sponsor of making Texas one of the states that made ma one marriage between one man and one woman. And we want to keep that going. On. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Mike Hamilton. Go to HamiltonForTexas.com and look me up. If you've got any questions, just ask, call. We're here for you. And thank you very much for letting me come out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me back there? Guys, I'm David Hennigan. I'm the sheriff of Tyler County. Four years ago, I was sitting in a hooch in Iraq. And at that time, since I couldn't make it back, my wife's the one who did the uh, presentation for me. So I'm going to give her the mic and she can do it now. <laughs> That's what I figured, yeah. No, uh, I, uh, guys, I don't really feel like I need two minutes. I feel like I've had three and a half years. In three and a half years, the sheriff's office is a different sheriff's office. It's a better sheriff's office. And it's going to continue to get better. I, my talking has been over the last three and a half years. I've been the most aggressive sheriff that you've ever had when it comes to narcotics enforcement, and I plan to get even more aggressive. I know those are important issues for you, narcotics enforcement, sex offenders. Those are all things that we're highly aggressive on, and we'll continue to be highly aggressive on. Uh, I don't know if you heard here recently, but we just had a nice little bust here, 90 grams of methamphetamine out of the, one of our local dealer's houses, and now he's you know, behind bars where he belongs. And uh, that just goes to show you some of the work we've been doing that just happened recently. And it's been happening over the past year and a half. I want you to take notice of what we've been doing. I want you to see what we've been doing. The Tyler County Sheriff's Office has been working hard for you. And I just want you to take notice of it. And if you will, if you truly will, I know we'll get your vote. Thank you very much. God bless.
After graduating from Woodville High School, I attended Angelina College and studied in criminal justice. I was accepted in the East Texas Police Academy in 1990. After that, I was hired in January of 1991 by the current Woodville Police Chief, where I served as a police officer and sergeant for 11 years. During those years, I had the opportunity to investigate crimes ranging from murder to traffic violations. I was the immediate supervisor to five patrol officers and three reserve officers. In 1998, I was named Durham Police Chief by the Woodville City Council. I have received a Masterpiece Officer Certification License at the highest level obtained in Texas. In early 2002, I made the decision to serve the people in a broader capacity as Justice of the Peace. In March that same year, I was honored to be elected. During my three terms, I have conducted over 500 inquests to determine the cause and manner of death of individuals that occur in our county. Having presided in over 1,000 justice and small claims court cases over the last 10 years, I feel I've gained the knowledge of the simple understanding that I want the citizen's voice to be heard. My name is Brian Weatherford. I am seeking the office of Tyler County Sheriff, and I appreciate your vote.
And if y'all give me the opportunity to serve you, I would just do that. I'm a workaholic and ask my wife that. And, uh, but uh, I give everything I can, you know, to represent y'all. I've been knocking doors, and I will continue to knock doors to the day of election. And if y'all give me the chance to be your commissioner, I will still come by and do it. Thank y'all very much.
Emergency Operations Center forward. Uh, we today we are in uh, reasonable shape. If we have a, a storm or something like that, we we will be, we'll be taken care of because of the uh, difference of uh, people, myself and commissioners and uh, uh, the county judge and others. Uh, we, like I say, I've, I've worked a wide variety of law enforcement experience. That's my identification of law enforcement. But whatever the task, I will improvise, change, do whatever I need to do to, to make it work. Uh, and I worked for the state for 23 years with the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, and I retired in 2008. I'm retired. I have a, uh, a pension, and I have uh, money coming in, so I don't necessarily have to have the, uh, uh, the funds. I'll be a full-time constable. Thank you. for Precinct 2 here in Tyler County. Ms. Lois and your Business Women Association, thank you very much for having us here tonight. I'm currently your constable for Precinct 2. I'm running for re-election. I moved to Woodville in Tyler County in 1978. Since that time, I have never left Tyler County. I've never left Precinct 2. I've owned my own business in Woodville and Tyler County since for the past 25, almost 26 years come June. I've been fortunate, raised two wonderful daughters. I have both daughters live here in the county. All three of my grandchildren live here in the county. I tell folks I've got them 15 minutes one way and 15 minutes the other. I've got the perfect setup. I have a vested interest in the people of Precinct 2 in Tyler County. I've been a member of the Woodville Fire Department for 25 years as well. Uh, currently, I'm a command officer with the fire department. And trust me, Dale, Dale knows this past year was an interesting one with all the fires. I was here to serve the county during both Hurricane Rita and Hurricane Ike. A lot of you we brought tarps to, brought gasoline and whatever you needed. Ask for your consideration, ask for your vote. I, for Precinct 2 Constable. Thank you. Uh, I am running for re-election in my precinct. 
I'm the first constable in the county that had a marked car in Precinct 4. Okay? Uh, and that car is a legend all in itself. <laughs> we have a, a good working relationship with the Sheriff's Department, with the Texas DPS, Parks and Wildlife, all the other law enforcement agencies in the county, and we want to continue that, and, as well as all the constables. My name is Jim Zaffrey, and I appreciate your support. Thank you. Stepchildren. One is a uh, at college at SFA. The other is a senior at Warren ISD. Going to A&M in the fall. Uh, I have worked for the sheriff's office for 22 years. I started there as a dispatcher and went to chief dispatcher, patrol division, and then became a sergeant. And I recently uh, was promoted to chief deputy of operations. Um, I am running for just some people, and I believe that with my experience through law enforcement, um, I've investigated everything from speeding, littering, right on up to homicide. Um, the just some peace duties, some of the uh, more well-known duties that they do, are Class C citations, traffic tickets. They handle those. They handle inquests, mental commitments, truancy, juvenile law, and I have experience in all of those. They also do civil process, and for the past, I guess, six years, I uh, have been attending more and more civil process, so it's kind of, I'm understanding it, but uh, anyway, um, I believe that I uh, can bring these qualifications to the Justice of Peace, and thank you very much. I've been in law enforcement over 20 years, and uh, if most of you know me, I have zero tolerance for illegal drugs. I've worked for several agencies, and uh, I worked two years undercover narcotics, and I know the, the uh, problems and that arise from people using and selling illegal drugs. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a proactive uh, police officer. I work for Woodville police officer right now, but I have my, uh, my plan is to uh, use my retirement uh, from the county and the city to be a full-time constable, and I will be on active patrol, and, and uh, I've probably arrested over a thousand people in my career, 20 years or better, and, and it's not hard to do. You, you get out there and you you find somebody with not wearing a seatbelt, not that you may, you know, you may just want to write a, write a warning, but then you smell something that's, you know, illegal or you see something and then you start digging and, and then that person may need to go to jail. But uh, I, uh, I just, uh, I know the, the, that the dealers need to go to jail and the users. The users are the ones who are breaking in your houses. They're, uh, uh, They'll catch you gone, they'll go in, they'll get your guns, and they'll sell them for $40, just enough to get them a fix. And uh, as constables, uh, and I'm nervous up here because it's a pretty good crowd. I can speak sometimes, but uh, anyhow. But I do appreciate uh, all you coming out. If you want to know more about me, ask some of the local law enforcement officers here, Woodville Police, Tyler County Sheriff's Office, Highway Patrol, Game Wardens, and they'll tell you about me. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. You're demonstrating the greatest privilege that we in the United States have got, the privilege of selecting who we want to serve us. I'm asking for your support, William James Beatty, PhD, as your Justice of the Peace for Precinct 1. I have spent my entire adult life serving my country and my community. I served it in Germany, I served it in Vietnam, 
and I served it here in the United States. I've been very dedicated to the concepts that are expressed in the Constitution, and I believe that they should be fully followed. The one area in the justice system that relies the most upon the Constitution is the court system. I would like to become a part of that court system so that I can make sure that our constitutional values are upheld in one place where the people can approach the government and give their complaints and their side of the story. There are three groups within the justice system. You've got the police, you've got the legislators, and you've got the courts. The police operate based upon the written law that is put out by the legislature. But it's the courts that has to sit between the two, make sure that law enforcement follows the laws that they are making, and the courts look at the laws that are made to ensure that they are constitutional. So that is the biggest protection for all of us. I've studied my entire life as an adult in the criminal justice system, and I would like to give that benefit of that knowledge, that background, and the experience I have in the on the police and the criminal, uh, the court system to provide the best service possible for you. Thank you. If you have a question, there they are. Who would like to go first? I don't have a question. I'll go first. Good. Thank you. Uh, you can come up here if you'd like. Well, I can yell pretty loud. That's good. My question is for the commissioners for Precinct 1. You're going to be making decisions of, for about 5,000 people, and I would like for whoever goes first, I don't care, to kind of give me the process that you go through to make these decisions. Whichever one first. Come up here you better come up. I, all I heard was what? the process no. to make a decision. Okay. This is for the commissioners, precinct okay. one. And the two of you, whoever won wins, will be making decisions for about 5,000 people. I'd like to know the process that you use to make those decisions. Go for it. Go ahead, Kansas. Stand up where you are. The way I'd make them is, is I would go to as many people as I can and get feedback from them, from y'all. And I would go back up there on what the people told me and, go, and make my decision on, on that is the way I would do it. <clears throat> well, I've made a few. Uh, I usually find out somebody that's familiar with the situation, find an expert, somebody that's involved, some people that's been through it, and uh, and go from there. I, my, my opinion is I think the people that voted me to make those decisions. That's my job. Uh, I'm not going to be able to make everyone happy. If I'm lucky, I make 51% of them happy. <laughs> and But uh, I try and get the most expert opinion as possible and uh, and go from there. And, uh, and also, I depend on my brothers on the court that, uh, that together the right decision to be made. I mean, we, we, we don't always agree. So the democratic process allows for some of us to make mistakes. Thank anyway, you. But that's how I do it. Whether I'm the sheriff, 
Davids this year, we're going to go out and we're going to do our job, okay? And he'll be able to tell you a little bit more about this. We've got prisoners that are being taken to other counties that are being housed. And at that time, at this time, we're doing, you know, the county as a whole, the public, the voters, the law enforcement commissioners are doing the best we can. I can assure you that if I'm elected your sheriff, that won't be an issue of, well, we can't arrest him, we can't house them. We're going to find a place. Those folks that need to go to jail, they're going to go to jail. <clears throat> the bottom line is money, and that's something that whether or not that has to go ultimately to a ballot, let the people of Tyler County vote on it. You know, I think that's something we're going to see in the very near future. But it's going to come down to the taxpayers to whether or not we have the capability of adding on to the jail. My position all along, uh, and I've expressed it with the current commissioner's court, is we need to put this before the people. We need to set up a ballot, but first educate them. Let them know the pros and the cons of building the jail. And then you can make an educated vote on the matter. Yes, it's going to be expensive, there's no doubt. But it's expensive whenever we don't build one also, in more ways than one. Yes, we spent $177,000 last year housing our excess prisoners outside of Tyler County. Now, yes, that may sound like a large number of money, but in comparison to the cost of the jail, is it? But there's also other repercussions. It's a simple fact that between the uh, probation, the DA's office, parole, yes, they're coming in and we're trying to keep the cost down to the county. Yes, we're putting them in as fast as we can. The $177,000 attests to that. We're definitely putting them in. Do we need a jail? Yes, we do. Why? Because we need to put people behind bars that, and they need to stay there for a while. They need to be taught a lesson. They're not being taught a lesson right now. It's like a revolving door up there. Yes, it's frustrating for me. It's going to be frustrating for him if he's your next sheriff. It's a very frustrating uh, matter to any sheriff. We want a bigger jail. Yes, if I had a bigger jail, I'm going to bring in the inmates from the, uh, from the feds, raise money like we did 10, 15 years ago, just, uh, just like they did. But, uh, so, yes, we need another jail, but if we can't afford it, then who's going to afford it? Is it going to be your children? Times have changed from, you know, 15, 20 years ago when I was there. So, I mean, we've got to, as we talk about expanding the jail on the county level, it's not a county problem. It's a city and county problem. And it definitely needs to be something that's going to be addressed on. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. 
when was the last time the city increased their share for what they're doing? Or do they pay? I mean, Actually, that's a matter that goes through commissioner's court as far as that arrangement that's made. Uh, I don't know of any increase that's happened. I, actually, it's always been negotiated. The sheriff has always made that negotiation and brought it to the court. I think they play somewhere in the neighborhood of $70,000 right now a year. And, uh, uh, they pay for half a dispatcher. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, there's some issues about the money that the city uh, and, and, and the facility and all that. Yeah, there's an issue there. So my time on the court, the sheriff has always negotiated that and basically brought it to the court. Uh, if it's the court has to do the proof.
service men, whether it's state or federal level. I'm the veteran service officer for this county, and that cuts across every precinct. Uh, and my concern is getting help for our veterans. Our existing commissioners su support our veterans. I have a feeling that this county supported veterans back during the Vietnam era, that the Mar veterans didn't go through what some of these guys did coming home when my generation came home because of the people that live in this county. So my concern is for all of you is to address issues for our veterans. My dad was a Vietnam veteran and when he came home he was spat on and he was called a baby killer. He was treated horribly. So I have a passion for the veterans and my heart breaks for them. And he's currently in care with the VA system uh, because they think he was exposed to Agent Orange and it's, called, it's caused peripheral neuropathy in yes. his body. So there's a lot that our government has done to damage the men and women in uniform and then what they've done is they promise them amazing benefits and care if they'll just serve for a little while and then when they come back home it disappears. They've had to fight in another nation for other people's freedom and for our freedom and then they come back home and they get to fight for the same things that their government promised them and that is just a crooked twisted lie from a bunch of people who've never served before. <laughs> Our government is cutting jobs for the men and women who actually serve on the front, but they've kept all the bureaucracy that has grown in our government. We don't lack funding, we lack priorities when it comes to the men and women who start the work. and I have a serious problem with that. The thing about our senators and people run, they will say, oh, I would never vote to cut benefits for veterans. Well, that's a little bit of a stinker of a lie, and I'll tell you why. Because the people who are appointed in the VA, they make the decisions on what happens to the budget top to bottom. The men and women who are in the U.S. Senate never really <coughs> vote to cut the benefits. But it's a great way for them to sound like they really care about our veterans. And I'll tell you right now, it's a bunch of baloney, and it's got to stop. We have men and women who've given everything. Because of Iraq and Afghanistan, we have more men and women who are surviving injuries they never would have survived 10 and 20 and 30 years ago. And now they need the care that it takes to fully rehabilitate, fully reintegrate, and live the fullest lives humanly possible. And they deserve the right to feel independent and not feel like they rely on the government for their survival. Thank you very much. disability. He was already on 70%. They checked him out, checked him over, misled him by sending in that letter, and then they cut him to a 20% wow. disability. It's not right. It's not fair. That's a true story. I mean, he's done everything he can to make himself healthy. He's had a bypass. He's a diabetic. And they cut his benefit 50%. It's not right. He needs to appeal. He needs to appeal. Okay. And an appeal, and appeal, and appeal. Well, and I also, I also said to his uh, current congressman just to see what he could do to help. But as part of that, the VA guys, to fight your appeal, they get paid full-time for it. For him to fight an appeal, 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 he didn't get paid for that. He's a better service officer that should be able to assist. Good. And I'm they sorry. need to know that. Yeah. Better service officer should be able to help. Okay. okay. Well, you didn't jump in. That's all I can say. Let's get him to say. I'm scared. <laughs> uh, I was born in Fort Benning, Georgia. My father was a paratrooper, and he was a staff sergeant in the National Guard. So I learned all my yes sirs and salutes and rode around in the Jeeps and had a good time when I was growing up, thinking that the Army was a neat thing to be in, or the National Guard or whatever. I came up for the draft, and my lottery number came up 363, so I did not have to serve. Uh, I mentioned the National Guard 
I, I don't know when we started using the National Guard to fight our wars. The National Guard was always our, our home security, our homeland security before the federal government took that away. And I think when they, they're real good at the liberal news, they like to say, well, this guy went crazy, or this guy killed this, or this guy did that. He had been, he had been deployed five times, like it was his mm -hmm. choice, his or her choice. You know, kids, they go in and they sign up to go into the military, and they think, well, I'm going to do my three years, and the recruiter says, you're going to get a college education, you're going to get this, you're going to get that, you're going to come out, you're going to be better off, you're going to have these benefits. And then they get home from doing their two or three year hits, and the phone rings 90 days after the bank, they go, uh, excuse me, you got to go back again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to go back again. You got to go back again. Five deployments is the average now when someone signs up to go to the military. You could spend 15 years, mm -hmm. eight to 15 years of your life overseas. So, what happens when you come? You know, we talk. I'm running in this race since last November. Somebody said last night, well, what are you going to do if you don't win? Well, there's going to be a void in my life, and I'll have to find something to compensate for it because I'm not on council after next week. And I enjoy being in politics and doing what I do. So what do you take to a veteran that comes back that's been all these times, and all of a sudden he's supposed to just go right over to Brooks Bros over here and buy groceries, and he's just normal. Everything's fine. He's back. I think we've got to get into the VA hospitals and make sure that we have extended time for these people, more benefits, more opportunities for them to get the help they need because they have a harder adjustment period these days than I think any of the previous wars that we've fought so far. We were lucky in World War II because we were able to go dominate countries and they had to do it our way or the highway. That's not the way we fight these days. I don't like the way that we fight. We don't, we don't play to win, which is terrible. But we cannot forget our veterans, and we've got to make sure that we take care of all of them, extend their benefits no matter what they need and what it takes. They should not be denied anything whatsoever. I, I am not someone who knows a Vietnam veteran. I am a Vietnam veteran and from combat service. I've got a good idea what's happening with our men and women coming back from the uh, east right now. I know the kind of problems I had, and I can understand the kind of problems that they have. And one of the problems that they are coming back with, according to the statistics, is post-traumatic stress disorder. And in most instances, they act erratically, which brings them to the attention of law enforcement, and before you know it, they end up incarcerated. That is the wrong way to treat those people. That's right. The best thing to do is to give them treatment so we can get them back into society again. I had gone through all that stuff already. I know what these guys need, and as Justice of the Peace and this comment for Precinct 1, I'll make sure they get treated properly. whole issue that you bring up, man, and I'm glad you did, is just a reflection on what our government in Washington, D.C. is all about right now, and it's shallow, empty promises that they have no intention of keeping, and they think that we as citizens will forget about what they promised and let just kind of let status quo continue. And I think in the Texas Senate, your word is your bond, and a deal is a deal. And that's how I've lived the last 25 years of my life being, being in public service is, if that is part of the deal that you made, you keep your deal, or else you lose your credibility with the whole world. And that's why I say, you know, uh, to me, you know, Obama wants to cut our military budget. He wants to bring these men and women back and put them out on the unemployment line. And uh, 
you know, just say you're on your own and keep the bureaucracy there just as big as it was. You're absolutely right. I say we could have a, a, a period where they could kind of throttle down a little bit. Let's take all those men and women and all that equipment that's coming back from Iran right now and spread it along the Texas-Mexico border. Yeah. 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 They'll be able to slow down and, and kind of acclimatize a little bit. But I know that they will do the job that the federal government won't, and that is seal the border and stop these criminals and poachers and drug dealers <laughs> from coming into the United States. That would be my, my uh, treatment plan, I'd recommend. <laughs> You know, you can kind of, my brother's in the military, I, I did not serve him. My brother's an F-15 fighter pilot, and so I spent a lot of time visiting him. He's, and it just goes back to what these other gentlemen say. If, you know, in Texas, you just kind of, you say what you're going to do, you do what you say. The same thing I believe that our U.S. federal government needs to do is take you from the military. We promise these benefits for, you know, carry through on the benefits. And that even goes the same thing as Social Security. They promise you Social Security. You need to pay forth on Social Security. I know that's a big uh, debate too. But I, don't, I agree with these other gentlemen. This be redundant for me to go over and over again. Thank you. I'd like to make one little statement. The county and the commissioner's court are in deep Gratitude to Ellen Craig, yes, her me. husband John, yes. and
And then Jock Blanchett came along, our kind of judge, and he was, we started picking up steam. <laughs> so this is so far more to me. And I know we have problems in the Senate. I know we have problems in Congress, in our jails, all up. But our biggest problem is who's in the Oval Office. Yes. Yes. And yes. we need to all band together, and this is just wonderful. This is like cake and ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a Republican when I was sworn in as mayor. I leaned over to the judge and I said, do I need to tell all these people I'm a Republican? He said, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. So we have come a long way, baby. <laughs> but our biggest battle is in the Oval Office. Yeah. And that's what we need to work on. That's what the jail commission said we cannot do. We cannot move Since prisoners our, out of the county so we can make room for $75 a day federal prisoners. We can't do that. Because we, we, I understand, but what I'm wondering is like when you say $177,000. Mm -hmm. That was at $40 a day for, for because we were completely days. full in our jail. Yes, but then if we had more room, then not only could we save the $40, but then we could also generate the $75. If we had room for all of the criminals, well, just to let you know, about 10 to 15 years ago, Tyler County was receiving a quarter of a million to $400,000 every year because they were keeping federal prisoners with their excess beds. Now, will that definitely happen if we build a jail? No, there's no guarantee on that. No, but but we do have to, to generate that money, to generate that revenue. The only way to generate is to build a bigger jail. Because right now, our jail is completely full up with Tyler County prisoners, including the ones that are over in Jasper County. The ones that are costing not making money. Those, those are all costing. Right now, the jail is working at a deficit. 10, 15 years ago, it was operating above. And I noticed someone said earlier in here about, you know, staying in the Tyler County Jail and enjoying it. Well, guys, let me tell you something. It was costing a buck 41 a meal when I came in as sheriff to feed each prisoner. Each meal. Dollar 41. Now it's down to 56 cents. So they don't want to come back to my jail. <laughs> Sacrifices may be made, they may be made in 
vehicles. Um, you know, that's a good spot that you can check. You can start and you maybe even use me. But going longer, not saying that these deputies in the back that are doing a great job, they need the equipment, but we've got to work within our means. Just as we've talked about the jail, it's got to be with our, within our means, and the public has to be happy with that. We, all of us, candidates and all, are paying for a service. We want that service to be provided and be provided efficiently and in a manner where we all, as taxpayers, you know, can afford that. So, I mean, we're going to work within the budget no matter what it is. In the last 10 years, it's just to the piece, I'm provided a small budget, okay? It's a small budget to operate under. Never have I ever been over. And we've handled over a million dollars through the last 10 years that have come through our office that I'm responsible for. So, working within my budget will not be a problem for me. It may be sacrifices that are done within the department but they will not, uh, you know, jeopardize the public in any way. Okay. Okay. In my budget, actually, whenever I came into office, it was just under two million dollars. The current auditor saw a certain few things that didn't even need to be in the budget because we had no control over how much that was spent, so they removed it out, out from underneath our line items. Now our current budget is 1.6 million dollars. For the past three years, at the end of the year, I've had enough money to go to the commissioners and say, hey, I've saved up enough money, I want to buy an extra vehicle. And that's been three years running I've been able to do that. That's how close an eye I keep on my budget. Thank you. I'd just like to say that I don't know, you know what you're talking about, you know, about you know, stretching that dog. I'll be the first to tell you that, that you can't spend no more than you got coming in. And I'm not going to be, I'm, I don't want to come to you and say, look, we out of money. We need to raise taxes. Because I think that's the people needs to, to, to make that decision. Now, I know that, that certain issues come up and everything, but wasteful spending. You know, if you can just control the spending and not spend anymore, then, you know, I think we ought to be fine. I would like to add one other little deal. Uh, we've been very fortunate in the county uh, for the last seven budget cycles. We've either kept the tax rate the same or lowered the tax rate. Last year was the first year that we raised the tax rate since I've been commissioner. Last year was the first year that we had a uh, loss in revenue. Uh, last year we cut half of the loss and we had a little tax increase. Uh, but we've been very fortunate with tax. This next year, we're looking at the same scenario, a loss in, in revenue. Your commissioner court has been very conservative and, uh, and I am extremely conservative. You ask any of my folks, I, I'm tight. You ask the chair. What's the question, chair? How much are you going to cost? Yeah. Anyway, the budget for Tyler County Precinct 1 is $643,000. I have uh, expenses right now. The budget is $543,000. Uh, it's been, we've done real well with our budget. In the last several years, I've had some money left over in my budget, which is the first time that's happened in Precinct 1 in a long, long, long time. And uh, the grants that we bring in, that's helping a lot. Thank you.
they are going up there. For every dollar they take in and spend a dollar fifty, the first thing that has to be done is cut the spend. We've got we've got so many giveaway programs that we have got to throttle and, and stop spending that money for <coughs> our kids. My grandkids that aren't here yet will be in debt. And uh, that's a number one thing. We, we give money to other countries so they can buy bullets and shoot at our troops. Thank you. Like I said earlier, I, the entitlement reform, we just give money out. We vote on foreign aid as a block. We 157 countries get foreign aid. We say yes, they get foreign aid. No, they don't get foreign aid. And they all go in as a block. I would like to see that we can vote for a country. Because we, we give a lot of foreign aid to people that don't like us. So if we could vote, yes, Israel gets foreign aid. No, I'm sorry, uh, China, we already owe you enough money. and as a city councilman did not raise taxes the six years that I was there. First of all, we have to start cutting from within. We have to stop the entitlements. We have to trim the fat, cut the pork, whatever we have to do to balance the budget from within. Stop giving country, countries foreign aid that don't like us. We need to do random drug testing for people on unemployment, yes. for people that are on welfare, Medicaid, Medicaid and, and we need to clean that up. We need to reduce the amount of unemployment to at least 12 months instead of 24 months. And that's where we need to start, become physically conservative, and, and that's where it all happens. Thank you. No more bailouts for anybody, whether that means a big bank or a woman who thinks her sex life should be paid for by your birth control money. <laughs> okay. Two, no more raising the debt ceiling. I have the most to lose in my race. If we don't get this right, it'll be my generation. And right now, they're saying our taxes could be upwards of 70% of our income if we keep spending the way we are now. Entitlements and defense, which means defense, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are 60% of our federal budget. If we do not deal with those major pieces, the rest of it won't even matter. Foreign aid is 1% of our budget. So we can get rid of it, but that's literally like saying, I'm not going to buy the 50 cent piece of Hershey candy in my $300,000 I make a year. That's how little it is compared to the rest of our budget. So yes, I am for ending foreign aid except to Israel, which is the only democracy in the East, and that is absolutely our ally, but we need an administration who treats them like an ally, that's yes. for sure. Yes. All right, so then on top of that, I believe when it comes to, we need to deal with Medicare and Medicaid. They have a $1 trillion annual budget and a minimum of it, a 10% minimum is fraud, waste, and abuse. Yep. Right. We deal with that alone and we will save big money for our people. I believe in a balanced budget, but I think it needs to have a super majority of Congress to vote for it, not just the president signing off because he created a crisis that he thinks needs more funding. We need higher accountability, no more debt ceiling raises, no more bailouts, no more bailing out foreign <clears throat> jerks, I think that's a nice word, who shoot at our people and then we bail them out with our military later on, we deal with entitlement reform, balanced budget, and we'll get this country back on track fast. I agree, no more increases in spending, and no more automatic increases. Freeze all spending, no more growth. We have over 200 duplicative agencies in our federal government. Let's wipe them out. Abolish, abolish, abolish. Go you know, my, my son and his wife own a place here in Tyler County. My daughter and her husband own a place. My wife and I Place. We pay taxes, and 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 uh, I'm all for I'm I'm all about law enforcement, and and when we arrest someone for uh, driving while intoxicated, or for possession of dope, or selling, or stealing, or anything, that's that's not a, uh, a, a violation against the city of Woodville or or a or a precinct. It's a it's a violation of the state. It's state law, that, and and. And I wish there was some way that uh, the state could help us with the jail and, and instead of us taxpayers putting the whole bill for uh, laws that the that, uh, state uh, sets and we're just uh, abiding by the laws and, and arresting them with the laws. But uh, anyhow, I just thought I'd throw that out.
Well, Mike Hamilton had to leave early, and of course James Wright couldn't make it. So, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. locally because that's the greatest asset that we have and that's why we make a hard decision and it's a dogfight when we go through budget here on your side of it and on the congressional member side of it whichever one of you wind up get familiar with our faces because tyler county and thank you Lila, for coming because you had a big statement which you could appear for but tyler county is noted for having facial appearances with our senator and our representatives so just be aware, whichever one of you, you'll be seeing a lot of us. <laughs> 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 